Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the Lenovo ThinkPad Z13. This is a very different looking and feeling ThinkPad. So this is kind of their concept car, perhaps, for the future of the line. And we're going to take a closer look at what this laptop is all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in on loan from Lenovo. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new Lenovo laptop is all about. Now the price point on this is around $1,350 and then escalates up from there based on configuration. We have kind of a middle of the road config here uh, with a Ryzen 7 6850U processor on board from AMD. There is also another Ryzen option, a 6860Z, which has the RDNA 2 architecture. So that one's gonna perform a little better than this one. But as you'll see, the performance of this device is very competitive versus many of the Intel laptops that are out there in the marketplace right now. This one has 16 gigabytes of DDR5 6400 RAM on board. The RAM is soldered on, it is not upgradable, but you can upgrade the storage. This one has a 512 gigabyte PCI Express 4 NVMe, and you can take the computer apart and swap that out later if you want. Now, all of the models have a 13 inch display. This has got a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, so a little taller than some prior generation laptops. This one is running at 1920 by 1200. This is an IPS display that has decent viewing angles on it. It runs at 400 nits and 60 hertz. There is an OLED version available that's in the same form factor here, but at a slightly higher resolution, 2.8K, and of course with better image quality that OLEDs provide, although that might come at the cost of battery life. But I found this display to be very nice on here. This is the mid-range display that supports touch, as you can see, and altogether a nice package here like we've seen on many other Lenovo laptops. Now, like most ThinkPads, the build quality here feels very premium, although it does feel a lot different than many other ThinkPads we have looked at. This is all aluminum. It comes in at about 2.78 pounds or uh, 1.26 kilograms. As you can see here, the display is well balanced, so you can lift everything up with one hand. It does have a larger area here for the webcam. They call this the communications bar, but it does give you something to grab onto when you do want to lift the laptop up. And speaking of webcams, it's got a 1080p webcam in that communications bar. It looks pretty good under most lighting conditions. One thing it lacks though is a physical shutter. There is a key on the keyboard here that will disable the webcam, but it won't physically cover up the lens like we've seen on prior ThinkPads. Now they also integrated some AI noise cancellation features into the microphone system. I did a little test of it with a vacuum cleaner running in my kitchen. Have a listen. And now we have the AI operating. Let's see how this sounds. Now, as far as ports are concerned, you've got a USB 4 port here on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you've got another one of those ports, a power switch and a headphone jack. And that is it on the port side. But the USB 4 port is significant here because up until now, Ryzen laptops largely could not work with Thunderbolt devices that you would use on an Intel laptop. And that meant you couldn't attach external GPUs or any other Thunderbolt device for that matter. But USB 4 integrates a lot of this Thunderbolt technology. So a little earlier, we did a video where we covered a lot of the things that work on this laptop that won't work on prior generation Ryzen laptops, including an external GPU. Definitely check out that video if you want to see it working in action, but I can tell you that uh, this is largely now a Thunderbolt compatible laptop in addition to all of the USB devices that are out there. Additionally, these are full service ports, so these can be used for power as well as video output along, of course, with those Thunderbolt and USB data devices. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, the look and feel of this ThinkPad is very different than the traditional ThinkPad look and feel that we're accustomed to. They very carefully make changes over the years, and here they're making a lot, I think, to see how the market might react. Now, the keyboard, trackpad, and track point all feel different on this one. The keyboard kind of feels like a mashup of their traditional 
ThinkPad design with their consumer design. And as a result, the keys are a little springier than you might be used to on a ThinkPad, but they're very large and well spaced and you get a good amount of key travel for a thin laptop like this. Not as much travel as you would have on a thicker laptop that would allow for the keys to travel down further. And there are a lot of ThinkPads that offer that. This one is shallower, but deeper than other uh, thin consumer laptops that are out there. The big change though involves the trackpad and the track point. This is a haptic trackpad, which means there are no moving parts on it. When you push your finger down, you're going to feel a click, but that click is coming from a haptic motor that's giving you a little bump when you push your finger down. And that is very similar, of course, to what we see on Apple laptops. This is the second one of these haptic trackpads that I've seen Lenovo do, and this one's a lot better than the prior edition. And you can also go into the control panel and adjust how much of a bump you get to get it to a point where it feels more like a mechanical trackpad, but it's definitely a nice improvement. But the thing that I'm having the most trouble with is the track point, which of course is the trademark feature of a ThinkPad. And this of course is something you move around with your finger to move your mouse pointer on screen. And typically you have three physical buttons on a ThinkPad above the trackpad. You have a left, a center button for scrolling, and a right button. On this one, the only way you can feel what button you're using is to try to figure out where the middle point is and then put your thumb somewhere to the left or right of that depending on what button you want to push. And it's a little harder to feel your way around with this to use the track point. So I'm struggling with this to kind of get a feel for it because typically when I use the track point, I like to put my thumb at the top where the buttons typically are located. That's how these uh, ThinkPads have worked since the beginning. And this one just doesn't have a place that I can feel where that button is. So even though you see a line here, there's actually no physical button there at all. You do get these little bumps in the middle for the scroll point, and this will work a lot like the scrolling button does on existing ThinkPads. So if I move my mouse pointer over here, push down those bumps, you'll see things moving. But again, these buttons don't have any bumps on them and that's what's been throwing me off. So I think if they adjust this design a little bit and maybe put a little bump so you can feel where your thumb is going, that might help. Of course, you could put your uh, thumb all the way down lower, but that's just not what I am used to as a ThinkPad user. So hopefully they will, uh, in future iterations, just put a little bump there so you know where your thumb is going. One other neat thing about the track point is that if you double tap it now, you'll get a little menu here of some different media controls that you can uh, make use of quickly. So you can start dictating into Notepad if you want using Microsoft Dictation here. Uh, you can also adjust the AI audio and that sort of thing. So what I can do now is just turn on speech services here. This of course all works through the Microsoft ecosystem, but what it's going to do is start typing out into Notepad and you can just double tap on that uh, tracking nub there to be able to pull that up. So this might allow for some additional shortcuts to come in the future, but definitely some changes here and it's up to you to decide whether or not you're comfortable with them. All right, let's take a look now and see how this performs. We'll begin by visiting a website here, the nasa.gov homepage. And as you can see, everything springs up very, very quickly here. Uh, this of course has Wi-Fi 6 on board, which I also have installed here at my house. So the network connectivity here feels nice and snappy. Video playback on YouTube and Netflix and others plays back fine with no drop frames. And overall, this is performing where I would expect a higher end laptop to perform. And of course, you can also make use of the touch display here when you're browsing. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 215, which puts this largely in the ballpark of other Intel and AMD based offerings currently on the market and a little bit of a boost over the prior generation 5000 series Ryzen processors. Now AMD has made a lot of strides in battery life on their new processors and this one is doing quite well. I would say in my testing, we're looking at 11 to 12 hours of useful uh, productivity time on this one. If you're sticking to the basics like email, web browsing and word processing, things that don't tax the processor all that much and you keep the display brightness at a minimum. It comes with a 65 watt power supply. This is a USB power supply, of course, and although the system doesn't need all this much power to operate, what it does let you do is charge the battery quicker while you're putting the computer 
under full load. So it's a nicely sized power supply here for the device. And of course, you can use docking stations and other things that provide power delivery over USB-C or Thunderbolt. One thing I would suggest that you do for the best performance when you're plugged in is to go into the Windows uh, power configurator here and make sure you have it set for best performance when it's plugged in. That way you'll get the most out of it. When it's in that mode, it's also going to run the fan a little more aggressively. So you're probably going to hear the fan noise a bit more. But the trade-off, of course, is you get better performance. The fan isn't all that loud for a small laptop like this, but when there are things cooking in the background, you're certainly going to hear that. Uh, the fan will run also when the system is doing updates. So when you first get it, you'll likely hear a lot of fan noise initially, which will tamp down after everything gets caught up for Windows and Lenovo updates. Now, of course, video editing and gaming will eat into the battery more significantly, but this is a really good performing laptop for both of those activities. Let's take a look at DaVinci Resolve here real quick. I've got a 4K60 clip that you saw a little bit earlier in this video. And what I wanna do is just put in a cross dissolve here. So I'll drag that into the timeline and play it back. And as you can see here, it's able to render that dissolve in real time here. Uh, using the onboard AMD graphics on that processor. Here's another one I just dropped in, not leaving any time for it to render it back out, and it's doing pretty well here with some basic video editing. If you go into more significant editing and color grading and special effects, that of course will require more horsepower, but the good news is with this machine is that because it has that USB 4 port on board, you can grab a, an external Thunderbolt GPU plug it into this thing when you're docked at your desk and be able to benefit from a desktop graphics card with this thin and light laptop. So let's move on to some gaming now. This is Red Dead Redemption 2, and we're running this at 1920 by 1200 at the lowest settings, and we're getting about 30 to 35 frames per second. So we didn't have to turn the display resolution down to get a playable experience here, at least with this display. If you have the OLED one, you'll want to uh, run it at a slightly lower resolution to get into the playable territory here. But all in, it was very consistent and a lot of fun to play on something that's very thin and light. You couldn't do this a couple of years ago, uh, but now you can with these Ryzen chips. And of course, this computer can get docked to a GPU for better performance when you are at home. We also ran Fortnite, this one also at the native resolution, but with the settings bumped up to medium, we were generally over 60 frames per second. It would dip down a bit depending on uh, what was getting rendered in the scene, but it was able to keep up pretty well here and provide a fast and playable experience, even with a little settings bump. And of course, we could turn those settings down and do even better than that. We also ran Doom Eternal, also at the native resolution of this display at low settings. And here we were generally around 55 to 60 frames per second. Again, very playable, and we could probably get even more out of it if we turn the display resolution down a bit. But overall, I am very pleased with the direction that these Ryzen chips have gone, and we're seeing better and better performance even as the computer's weight and overall footprint has gone down. So this is an exciting time if you are looking for a laptop that can do everything. We also ran some benchmarks, and let's start off with the 3D Mark Time Spy test. And there we got a score of 2,524, which puts this one right in line with what I've seen from other Ryzen chips in this generation. It also is besting on that test, at least, what we saw out of a current generation Intel processor, an i7-1260P. So overall performance here looks pretty good and certainly much better than the prior generation Ryzen chips we looked at just a few months ago. And we also ran the 3D Mark Wildlife test, and there we got a score of 15,390 on the regular version and 3,949 on the extreme version of that test. And you can see the Apple MacBook Air with the M2 processor is besting this one on those tests. And of course, that one is more power efficient, but the gaming compatibility is going to be much better on this Windows device than it will be on the Mac. So although you might get better graphical performance out of one of those Macs, you're not gonna be able to play the games that take advantage of what those chips can offer. So if you are in the market for a Windows machine, this is certainly at the top of the list right now, at least in so far as how these benchmarks look. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a score of 91%. 97% is a passing grade. And what that score indicates is that you'll probably see an 8 or 9% performance reduction when you place the computer under load 
over an extended period of time. Games will do that. A long video render would do something like that. But you should be able to see decent full performance out of it when you're doing short bursty kinds of things like rendering one of those video transitions we looked at earlier. It's not unusual for small laptops like this to not get a full passing grade on that test, but this one is actually doing a little better than what we typically see with laptops in this form factor. But of course, that fan will definitely be running to keep it at that performance level. Now, as far as its speakers are concerned, I found the audio quality to be quite nice out of it. You don't get booming bass, but you do get a nice range of sound, which sounds great for games, music, and spoken word, and of course, any conference calls that you might be on. Let's take a look now and see how it handles operating systems other than Windows. So here is Ubuntu 22.04 running on the laptop here. And as you can see, we've got our web browser up and running here. Wi-Fi is working, Bluetooth is working, along with audio and video. The touchscreen is getting detected and the track point and the trackpad both work and the clicking mechanism works here as well. So it looks like this all operates inside of the hardware as opposed to requiring a driver, or if there is a driver, it looks like Ubuntu is able to pick it up in this version. So if you were looking to play around with Linux on here in a dual boot scenario or something like that, I think you'll be able to make use of it on this device without much trouble. So overall, I'm very pleased with what Lenovo put together here. This is a very nice laptop, and the question is whether or not ThinkPad users will agree it's a very nice ThinkPad because it does mess with a lot of the conventions that ThinkPad users are accustomed to. And I guess the market will decide on this one, which is probably why Lenovo is releasing it. And I think if you are comfortable with some of the input changes, you'll be pleased with the overall performance, battery life, and its form factor. It's a very nicely put together computer. That is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. Don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.